We are back with Ron Nehring. He worked with the RNC for several years and for Ted Cruz and Jason Johnson, uh, our MSNBC political guru. Ron, uh, is there a mathematical problem facing Trump here in these early results? And if so, uh, will lying about it make it go away? Well, I agree with your analysis, and it's not only in the early results, but it's reflected in the results from 2020 as well as in the polling data. Uh, I think in Donald Trump and Joe Biden, both candidates have a, an issue with being able to go beyond their diehard base. And this election in 24 is not going to be a turnout election. It's going to be a persuasion election. And the advantage is going to go to the candidate who can successfully go beyond that hardcore Base and to reach voters, particularly those who are in suburbia. And I think that that's where the biggest challenge is. In terms of whether lying to yourself can overcome that, you know, there's spin and there's what, you know, political candidates, you know, tell the press and, and they're trying to create an illusion uh, and then hope that that illusion of unity, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But at the end of the day, we need to have an evidence-based party and an evidence-based campaign. And that means that Donald Trump or Joe Biden, the advantage is going to go whichever, to whichever candidate can go beyond their base and successfully persuade people who either didn't vote the last time or voted for the other team last time. Yeah, and Ron, you know, you, you were part of the Cruz effort. Early on, you had the elite skeptical of Trump, uh, which shows that there are many people in the Republican Party who had reason to be against him in 15, 16. Uh, what we showed now is a, is a total reversal. Uh, what do you make of that, and is it a disservice um, to rank and file Republican voters to have the RNC sort of pushed into uh, claiming this thing is over when it would seem that 35, 40, sometimes 45 percent of the active primary voters uh, are still open to something else. Yeah, I completely agree. I think the Republican Party, my party, since I was 18 years old, is strongest when it's a party from the bottom up, not a party from the top down. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why discussion at the RNC to declare or proclaim Donald Trump to be the nominee before he's actually won the delegates does him and everyone else a disservice because mm. it delegitimizes an eventual victory if if, uh, if he were to, to win the nomination, which, of course, he appears to be on track for. But make no mistake, Donald Trump is the establishment Republican candidate. He has the overwhelming majority of congressional endorsements uh, and, uh, and party leaders and elected officials and the like. Uh, now it's up to the voters to make their decision known. Currently, of course, they favor him, as we've seen. Uh, but at the end of the day, you need to have a good process, which represents the bottom-up will of the party. Yeah. And so that's why this process has to take of course, and the voters have to have their say. Really interesting. Uh, now I'm going to talk about you to Jason. It's something like if you do this at a dinner party, it's weird. But on TV, it's <laughs> semi-normal. Jason, Ron is not a rhino. Ron is not a center-right Republican. Uh, he's a pretty conservative Republican. Uh, he's associated with the conservative wing of the party. And I think it's interesting to hear him say, apparently, because he's not afraid in D.C. or whatever else, uh, of what's pretty obvious in these numbers, which is, no, we can't predict anything. Um, but, Jason, uh, Donald Trump is probably the mathematically weakest person with the White House credentials uh, right. to run in a modern primary based on these numbers. Right. And, and to go with what Ron said, look, I get it, ground up. But here's the thing. Trump started from the bottom, but he's only here. Right. He's essentially the incumbent. He should be up here. He should be winning these primaries in the same way that Joe Biden is winning the primaries with 80, 90 something percent of the vote. And he's not getting it. And, and to go even further, Ari, if you look at what the Republicans would actually need to win a presidential election, I went real granular with South Carolina. They had about 12,000 mail in ballots. Right. Out of the 12,000 mail in ballots, only 122 because we have racial information of it. Only 122 were African-American. There were a large number of majority black precincts in South Carolina where there were no votes whatsoever. If Trump's part of his strategy is he's supposedly expanding to black voters, supposedly expanding to Hispanic voters, he's got to get better numbers than that. And in a state like South Carolina, where 30 percent of the voting population is African-American, he did terrible. He did terrible. And he's going to need something more than older white conservative voters in order to win in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and to actually win a general election. And none of the numbers that came out of South Carolina supports Trump being any more successful in 2024 than he was in 2020 hmm. or 2016. Ron, did you catch Jason's Drake reference? It was subtle. Um, it, no, I'm yeah, not he, that hip. He, he to, it's okay. Uh, it's just be too into that. Yeah, he just tucked it. He tucked it in there. Uh, started from the bottom. Now Trump's here, and he's here, not there. Uh, and so, Ron, as someone who's involved in the party, 
What do you think is happening behind closed doors? I mentioned the contrast with the Wall Street Journal because uh, everyone can have motivated reasoning, as the psychologists call it, uh, but the people writing the journal editorials, they want to beat Biden. And they're trying to flag this now, either to say maybe there's an alternative to Trump, or if that door is closing, uh, then they want to in influence how Trump and his allies see the electorate and what play they're making. Uh, what did you make of that editorial and sort of that tension within the party right now? Yeah, I think that there are people who are focused on trying to raise money and uh, gin up the base in order to have an overwhelming victory on Super Tuesday and in these primaries. And then eventually there'll be people who think about how do we win a general election? And one thing is for certain, if you rerun the 2020 campaign in 2024, Joe Biden wins again. Hmm. So the question then becomes, is it, it, Donald Trump needs the support of everyone who voted for DeSantis and everyone who's voted for Nikki Haley and a percentage of people who didn't vote and those who voted who uh, voted for Joe Biden last time. I think the, the Trump strategy right now should be to uh, to be very gracious and positive toward Nikki Haley, confident that he's on track to the nomination, and then he should absolutely love bomb uh, those Republicans who voted for DeSantis, who voted for Nikki mm. Haley, who sat out last time and the like. He should acknowledge their concerns as legitimate. Is he known? He no, I'll let you finish. But is he known for love bombing? No. And that's why his greatest strength is his greatest weakness. His greatest strength is his ability to generate intensity among Republican primary voters. And we saw that in 2016. We saw it in 20. We see it in 24. But that's also his greatest weakness, because when you apply that same approach, you know, the name calling and the belittling and the over the top stuff that turns off people in the following category, and that is people who might support his policies but don't support his conduct, and they believe his conduct is more important. That segment of the electorate is critical, and most of those voters are in suburbia. It's the suburbs who decided the 20 election, and the suburban voters are going to decide hmm. who's the president in 2024. Really, really interesting hearing from both of you on this, as the numbers don't say exactly uh, what Trump was hoping he could convince people, they say. Um, Ron Nehring, Jason Johnson, my thanks to both of you kicking us off.